Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles podcast. I'm Emily Bennington Perry with the Circle of Atonement. And yes, that is my new surname. As some of you may know, Robert and I got married last week, and we are very grateful to everyone who has sent us your blessings and your well wishes. We had a lovely ceremony at Mebkin Abbey in Charleston, South Carolina. Some of the photos were posted on the Circle's Instagram account. So if you want to see the pictures of our big day, you are invited to search for Circle of Atonement on Instagram and you can find them there. As magical as our wedding was, and as much as I still feel in the glow of it all, I am here to talk to you today about something else, namely the topic of spiritual bypassing and A Course in Miracles. This is something that I've been interested in for many years now, in part because this is a topic that keeps getting associated with the course. And so recently we hosted a Sunday gathering on it for our course companions community here at the circle. I delivered the message that day and the response to that gathering made us feel like we wanted to record and release the message at the heart of it, the sermon at the heart of it as a bonus episode of this podcast. And so that's what I'm doing here today. And my goal is not only to continue the dialogue on spiritual bypassing, because I do think that this is a very important topic to discuss, but here at the circle more broadly, our goal is to do what we can do to clear the air. So I'd like to begin with a definition of spiritual bypassing. And the best one that I've found is when we, quote, use spirituality to sidestep the work of facing issues on a personal, interpersonal, or systemic level. And I want to be clear here at the very beginning that I do believe spiritual bypassing is real. I have seen it. I have done it. When something is too hard or too painful to confront directly, it is very easy to hide behind spiritual truth as a way to avoid something that really needs to be addressed. And so we do. We've all seen what is commonly called toxic positivity, where no negative feelings are validated or even allowed at all. If you've been in the spiritual space long enough, you have surely attracted that well-intentioned friend who forces themselves and everyone around them to remain in a completely positive state regardless of the situation regardless of the level of pain that they're experiencing or regardless of the level of pain that you're experiencing. The catchphrase of this state is high vibes only. And an extreme version of this is what we call quote unquote bliss ninnies. I didn't actually know what a ninny was before I looked it up in preparation for that Sunday gathering sermon. But when I looked it up, it turns out ninny is a very old word with an origin possibly in innocent, which you should remember because that's going to be important later. The definition of bliss ninnies is, quote, those who appear to be intoxicated on spiritual teachings while also being ungrounded and untrained. Now, by all accounts, course scribe Bill Thetford had a very low tolerance for bliss ninnies. According to those who knew him, he would always say, keep those bliss ninnies away from me. Now, there are other hallmarks of spiritual bypassing besides toxic positivity and bliss ninnies, but I want to hone in on this idea of being unreasonably optimistic because this is what gets critiqued the most and because this is what we see most connected to the criticism of the course in this area. And so I want to give you an example by reading to you a part of a Facebook post that was written by a very popular and best-selling author and spiritual teacher here in the United States. And this post was written soon after the murder of George Floyd, but it also recently just made the rounds again. So I'm going to read you a section of this. It's not the whole thing. The post itself is 
very long, but I've just pulled out of it a few relevant pieces. And I want to be clear here that there are many posts like this online. I'm sharing this one in particular because it's reflective of general criticism the course receives when it comes to spiritual bypassing, and also because it has the added convenience of going through the criticism point by point, which makes it easier on me. So in other words, I am not trying to call out this particular author. I have read her work for years, and I know her to be a very sincere and very smart spiritual teacher and seeker. The reason I'm sharing parts of this post is because it's the best one that I could find at summarizing what's being said about the course on this topic of spiritual bypassing. So if you've heard the course associated with spiritual bypassing, most of this will sound very familiar to you. And again, if you haven't heard the course associated with spiritual bypassing, then this will give you an idea of what people are saying. So the post begins, since I mentioned that A Course in Miracles does not sit well with a lot of marginalized people, and we might want to rethink imposing it on others for whom it might not feel empathetic, sensitive, and inclusive, a lot of people have said, but why A Course in Miracles? It's all about choosing love over fear, and what can be wrong with that? We'd have to unpack the material line by line, which is not my calling to do, but since I was asked to comment about why this one quote from A Course in Miracles might not land well for Black, Indigenous people of color, the BIPOC community, or other marginalized people, I thought I'd demonstrate just this one phrase. Now, as a side note from me here, despite being called a course quote, what I'm about to read next is not actually a course quote. So if you do a search for the passage cited, you won't find it. It's a mix and match of course ideas, but all of them are true enough to what the course says. So back to the post. This is the quote that she references. What is our purpose? To attain a peace that passeth understanding. What is it that attains this peace? It is the mind. How do we attain this peace? Through the practice of true forgiveness. How do we know when we have it? When absolutely nothing of this world can disturb you in any way, then you have finally realized there is no world. So then the author returns with, this all sounds great, right? To white privileged people. Who doesn't want peace, forgiveness, and a way to be undisturbed in a disturbing world? So let's start with unpacking how it might land on someone who's really struggling in a world not made to privilege them. Then she goes and takes the quote and then dissects it line by line. So she starts with the first line. What is our purpose? To attain a peace that passeth understanding. And she says, while this quote might make you feel good when you're doing your spiritual practice, and that's fine as long as it doesn't prevent you from social justice action, repeating this quote to a suffering person who is not getting their basic needs met could sound tone deaf, insensitive, arrogant, and self-righteous. And the next line is, what is it that attains this piece? It is the mind. And the author continues with, So all we have to do is think with our minds and change our thoughts about peace and our outer needs become irrelevant. To tell a person that their fearful thoughts are the opposite of love when they love their kids and are afraid they might not be able to feed them is just cruel. To tell them a miracle would happen if they choose love instead of being frightened is mean. Moving on, let's unpack this phrase. How do we attain this peace? Through the practice of forgiveness. How do we know when we have it, when absolutely nothing of this world can disturb you in any way? And she continues with, who doesn't believe in forgiveness? Of course, forgiveness is a core part of the spiritual path, but not the premature forgiveness of spiritual bypassing, the kind that is meek and gutless and conflict avoidant. Real forgiveness comes when you've been hurt and you demand justice and stand up for yourself When those who have done you wrong confess their wrongdoings, make apologies, make amends, participate in restorative justice, and stop doing the thing that hurt you or anyone else. As for letting the world disturb you, if nothing in the world disturbs you right now, then you are so privileged you've managed to escape reality altogether. 
while most people are legitimately disturbed about the world because we should be. And then she goes on, let's unpack the last phrase. You have finally realized there is no world. And she says, but there is a world and it's full of suffering. And if you're really a spiritual practitioner, you know that none of us can be free until we all are free. And we are far from creating a just world where everyone is free. Now, there's a lot there. And before I dive into my comments from the course, I just want to point out that Jesus in his ministry 2,000 years ago did everything this author has just cautioned against. His whole ministry was about telling marginalized people higher truths of unconditional love. And he was not talking to privileged white people. He was talking to the poor and people on the very edge of survival. And when Jesus looked at them, he didn't see them defined by their unprivileged state. He saw a greatness in them that could rise to his message. That's what he did 2,000 years ago. And that's what he's doing in the course today. So with that aside, let me respond to this from more of a in the course perspective. As you can see from the post I shared, the arguments around the course and spiritual bypassing can initially sound very persuasive, perhaps a little too persuasive, because I know very serious course students who have been confronted with these ideas, and it's caused them to question the course as their path and even abandon it altogether. And so for those of us who also care about making the world a safe place for everyone, and who also want to keep the course as our path, where does that leave us? How are we to think about all of this? And so to answer that question, we have to come back to what it means to be a course student. Because in the end, all of this boils down to what you believe is real and what you believe is unreal. So the introduction to the course says, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. And so I want to be clear, to be a course student means that what is fundamentally real to you is that God's son is guiltless. This is non-negotiable. No matter what section or lesson that you're on, just watch and you'll see that the course always eventually is going to make its way back to this idea. The central teaching of the course is forgiveness, and we forgive on the basis that God's son is guiltless. And as an experiment, on the morning that I delivered this sermon to our course companions community, I opened the course to a random page And it was the condition for knowing God section in chapter 14. And the first line of that section is, unless you are guiltless, you cannot know God, whose will is that you know him. We so want to water down this idea. We so want to make exceptions. But the course repeats that exact line, God's son is guiltless five times. And again, it always will find its way back to this idea. The manual says, quote, there is a course for every teacher of God. The form of the course varies. So do the particular teaching aids involved. But the content of the course never changes. Its central theme is always God's son is guiltless and in his innocence is his salvation. The circle of atonement section in the course, the section that gave this place its name, opens with the line, each one has a special part to play in the atonement, but the message given to each to share is always the same. God's son is guiltless. So again, to be a core student means that you are just coming from a different understanding of what is ultimately real. And I'm sharing that with you because what others may think of as bypassing is possibly just a difference in belief about whether we can truly make ourselves guilty. As course students, it is our job to stand for the fact that God's son is guiltless. 
different paths, have different core beliefs, and there is nothing wrong with that, but this is ours. One thing that Robert always used to say to me that I'm now continually saying to everyone else is before we get into the yeah, buts, yeah, but what about this horrific situation? And what about this terrible abuse? Before we get into all of that, let's just take a moment to fully appreciate the course's position. And the course's position is that those who have quote unquote sinned, regardless of what they've done on the level of form, are still as pure as God on the level of spirit, because in their purity abides his own. So no matter what they've done, and we're talking about the worst of what human beings can do to each other here, they can never make themselves guilty. And we should be grateful for that because in their innocence is our salvation too. So in other words, if they can't make themselves guilty, then neither can you. So again, this is not bypassing. This is a difference in belief about what is ultimately real. But when you're reading posts like the one I just shared, And when you're hearing things from your friends and from your family that directly question these beliefs, things that sound really reasonable, it's hard to know what to do. So, for example, the Course says, the past is over. It can touch me not. What do you say to the friend who says, we absolutely have to remember the past if we're ever going to change the future? The Course says, you are not a body. What do you say to the friend who says, that's easy for you to say, tell that to the mother of Breonna Taylor or Tyree Nichols and the other countless parents who are worried that their child might be next. The course says that anger is never justified and people will say that's impossible, number one. And number two, we absolutely need to be angry because it's anger that creates real change. It's our anger and it's our outrage that causes us to take to the streets and say, stop right there to people who are abusing their power. The Course says that in your true nature, as God created you, you cannot be hurt. And when you talk about this idea, you will inevitably have people in your life say, I'm sorry, that is just gaslighting people into accepting their own abuse. Don't get me started on how the Course says we forgive others for what they did not do. That one might lose you some friends. So holding your ground on the view that unconditional forgiveness means unconditional forgiveness requires real conviction. And it's a lonely place to stand because you appear to be directly clashing with the cultural movement towards real accountability and systemic change. And sometimes you will be made to feel as if you are actually in the way of that change. And so how do we put all of this together? How are we as course students supposed to hold the idea that God's son is guiltless while also living in this place where everyone seems so guilty? There's a lot in the course that addresses this idea very specifically, but I want to spend the rest of our episode on a real gem of a section in chapter three called Innocent Perception. If you look at this section closely, you'll see a three-stage process that Robert outlined in his commentary for our A Year Through the Text program that we can apply directly to this idea of spiritual bypassing. So this process is a really brilliant and relevant way through this topic. And so I'm hoping that we can all take it in and use it when we're asked about this idea. Now, before I get into the stages, I can't resist pointing out some sentences in this section. The first one is we have repeatedly stated that the basic concepts referred to throughout this course are not matters of degree. They are all true or all false, and innocence is also not a partial attribute. So these are lines from this innocent perception section, and they're all reinforcing that idea that God's son is guiltless. Innocence 
means guiltless. And in your true nature, you cannot be partly innocent or partly guilty. It's not a matter of degree. You are either all innocent or all guilty. It's either all true or all false. So I told you this idea was absolutely everywhere in the course. And keeping that in mind, I want to go through the three stages and see how they each apply to spiritual bypassing. So this isn't the course's language. Again, this is Robert's language from the text commentary. But the stages are partial innocence, partial wisdom, and true innocence. And I'll just go through them very quickly, one by one. But keep in mind, this is all very fluid. So in other words, you you can move between these stages and you'll most likely go forwards and backwards all the time. The first stage is partial innocence. This is what we normally just call innocence. And we're calling it partial innocence because as you'll see, it's not the real full innocence towards which the course is heading. So one definition of innocence in the dictionary is being unacquainted with evil. So this idea is what defines this first stage of partial innocence. So in other words, you look around the world and you see only the best. You see only the light. This is where we get into the proud avoidance of the news because to be unacquainted with evil is just to make sure it doesn't show up on your screen. So there's a lot of good intention in this first stage, but at the same time, this is also what we can call the bliss nanny stage, because this is that place of toxic positivity that I referenced earlier, where there is just a refusal to see anything negative. There is a refusal to look at the evil in the world, and there is an overemphasis placed on the positive. So most of the time when you hear about spiritual bypassing, this is the stage that's being referenced. This is the stage that was being referenced in that post that I shared earlier. When there's no real looking, there's no real dealing with anything that's uncomfortable. There is only that false sense of happiness and security where everything is love and light, but we all know that that is an immature form of spirituality because we all know it's pretend. But unfortunately, we can get stuck in this stage and refuse to outgrow it. But I want to be really clear here that this is something that the Course itself criticizes. So the Course says, quote, the partly innocent are apt to be quite stupid at times. That's strong language for the course. The course doesn't use the word stupid, but it says the partly innocent are apt to be quite stupid at times. And that's because this first stage is really just denial. So We've probably all done this. I know I have. We have walked forward armed with our lofty spiritual principles. We're surrounded by light. We're seeing only the best. And we do that. And then we get slammed by the very darkness that we're ignoring. There's a funny cartoon that I found when I was doing the sermon on um, the sermon on this topic and it's a dog sitting in the middle of a room with a cup of coffee and he's smiling and he's saying this is fine while the whole house is burning around him and that's what we associate with partial innocence it's just a refusal to look at evil in the world The second stage is partial wisdom. And this one's really interesting because this one is where most of us tend to live. So if innocence is defined as being unacquainted with evil, wisdom is defined as the ability to make good judgments based on what you have learned from your experience. With quote unquote wisdom, you are now able to navigate the world because you've learned through experience how the world works. 
And what does experience teach you? Experience teaches you that the world is full of evil. That you need to watch out because at every corner, there's going to be someone who wants to take advantage of you. And experience teaches you that love and light are going to get you run over. So whereas in the first stage, you were unacquainted with evil. In the second stage, evil is everywhere you look. Now, we're calling it partial wisdom because, again, this is not the true wisdom that the Course is taking us to. Once we transition from the first stage of partial innocence into the second stage of partial wisdom, we can also spend decades here. So we can also stay stuck in this stage of partial partial wisdom as well. So rather than ignoring our trauma or the trauma of others, in this stage, we fixate on it. So in other words, we get attached to it. We construct an identity around it. And we use our trauma as the lens through which we see everyone and everything. In a search of spiritual bypassing for the the sermon, I also found an image of a protester holding up a sign that read, there is not enough sage in the world for this shit. (laughs) And I know a lot of those people, and I'm sure you do too. We all have those friends who are like, fine for you to be on your spiritual path while I'm over here doing the real work of saving the world. Now, the danger of that approach is that it leads to a lot of anger. And so if the marker of partial innocence is denial, the marker of partial wisdom is righteous anger. And this righteous anger is a problem in its own right, because for one, it's naive. It carries the feeling that the anger in itself is the force of positive change. So it whispers to you that if your anger can just reach the wrongdoers, then they will see the errors of their ways and change. But we all know that that's not how people work. And so when you're in that state of righteous anger, saying that denial is naive You're not seeing the ways in which your righteous anger is naive. Another reason anger is the problem in its own right is because, as we've all no doubt experienced, we slowly get sick of our own anger. We get tired of being an angry person, and others get tired of being around an angry person. So that inherent goodness in us becomes increasingly uneasy living with the destructive force of anger and anger carries that residue that just doesn't feel good. So in short, anger is just like an addiction. It promises that it's going to take you somewhere glorious when really in the end, all it does is eat you from within. So that's the second stage of partial wisdom. In this stage, the error isn't so much denying the evil of the world, it's clinging to it. So in this stage, we're not refusing to look at evil. Evil is all we can see. So then there's the third and final stage. And this is what the Course calls innocent or true perception. And this is the stage of real innocence and real wisdom. Because this is where those two qualities of innocence and wisdom meet, and then they actually become the same thing. So it might be confusing. How can these two qualities that seem so opposite actually come together to the point where they fuse? The key lies, again, in going back to that question of what is truly real. So Partial innocence believes that the evil out there is real, or why else would we have to avoid it? And in partial wisdom, we also assume that the cruel world that we see out there is real, and if you're not acknowledging that, then you are in denial. In this third stage, however, our wisdom dives deeper. So without denying the way things are in this world, 
Our wisdom sees beneath the surface. It sees a deeper reality, a level that is more real, so real, in fact, that it is the level of true reality. This seeing of what is truly real is the defining quality of innocent perception. So here's what Jesus has to say about it in the innocent perception section. He says, quote, the partly innocent are apt to be quite stupid at times. That's the quote I already read. But the passage goes on to say, it is not until their innocence is a genuine viewpoint, which is universal in its application, that it becomes wisdom. Innocent or true perception means that you never misperceive and always see truly. More simply, this means that you never see what does not exist in reality. So if wisdom is seeing things as they are, then innocence becomes wisdom when it sees things as they truly are. You never see what does not exist in reality. So here's another passage. The Course says, If nothing but the truth exists, and this is really redundant in statement because what is not true cannot exist, right-minded seeing cannot see anything but perfection. We have said many times that only what God creates and what you create with the same will has any real existence. This, then, is all that the innocent can see. So. The innocent see only the perfection that God created because only that perfection has any real existence. And this leads us to the final key passage where we see both of these qualities, innocence and wisdom, joined together. So the Course says, innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil which does not exist. It is, however, perfectly aware of everything that is true. So innocence is unaware of evil and wisdom sees what is real. Innocence is wisdom because in truth, evil is not real. Therefore, you can be completely innocent and completely wise at the same time. Your innocence can be fully wise, and your wisdom can be perfectly innocent. So the benefit of this approach is that then you get to be wise without the anger because you are gazing on the reality between the surface where evil does not truly exist. All that exists on that level is perfection. On that level, everyone is holy, God's son is guiltless, and everyone is God's son. Here, you are not in denial. I want to be really clear about that. You are not in denial. You are looking straight at the horrors of the world. You know how the world works. You are not surprised when corruption is revealed. You're not surprised when banks fail, when trains derail, when people are cruel, and when the world takes a turn to the dark side. You get it. But while you are looking at all of that, and while you are take ac- taking action to heal all of that, you are also using what the Course calls true denial. Now, this isn't regular denial. This is what the Course calls elsewhere the positive use of denial. You are looking straight at the lovelessness in the world, but you're denying that that lovelessness has any power to hurt you. You're denying the ability of anything that is not of God to affect you in any way. You know the darkness is out there. You are working to bring light to that darkness. You are working to bring healing to everyone. But you also know that the darkness isn't real. So this third stage is not the bypassing of the first stage. It is looking at the darkness in the world and bringing healing to it by acknowledging a reality that the darkness doesn't exist. But it's also not what we might call the never passing of the second stage. So I say never passing because, as we all know, the more that you stare at what's wrong in the world, the more real it becomes to you. 
And the more anger and judgment and scorn and blame that is real to you, the more you heap it onto other people. And then the tighter their grip on error becomes, and then nothing heals from that place. And so what we want is we don't want spiritual bypassing. We also don't want never passing. What we want is healthy passing by that comes with this third stage. So the Course speaks a few times of passing by illusions. There's one quote that says, He, he meaning the Holy Spirit, will not tell you that your brother should be judged by what your eyes behold in him or what his body's mouth says to your ears or what your fingers touch reports of him. He passes by such idle witnesses, which merely bear false witness to God's Son. He recognizes only what God loves, and in the holy light of what he sees, do all the ego's dreams of what you are vanish before the splendor he beholds. That's what we're going for. So you look at someone, but you don't judge him or her by how he looks, how they look, or what they say. You don't judge them by their earthly persona. You pass by such idle witnesses, knowing that they bear false witness to God's son. And instead, you recognize only what God loves in this person, because only what God loves in that person is real. And that's how you see other people with innocence and wisdom at the same time. And that's how you can go out into the world and bring real healing. I think by now we know that This is what really heals in the world. We know by now that what Martin Luther King said in his life was right when he said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Again, this is how Jesus changed the world. He did not ignore corruption in his society. He saw the wealthy preying on the poor and people being pushed to the margins who could not obey all of the purity rules. He also saw something else. He also saw more deeply. He saw, as the Course says, the face of Christ in all his brothers, and thus he remembered God. So. That sight of a deeper reality in everyone where evil does not exist, that is what has the power to change things. That's what allowed Jesus to work miracles. That's what allowed him to turn his crucifixion into a resurrection. That's what allowed him to shift history on its axis. So yes, partial innocence is naive. We all know that. Bypassing is naive. We all know that. But partial wisdom is naive too. It claims to see clearly how the world works, but it doesn't know how the world changes. To think that you can really change people and the world itself through anger, that's naive. To think that you can never pass through your hurt and your trauma You never pass through the darkness. You never pass through the evil. That's naive. You're just fueling more of it. And so what really changes things is what the Course says all along. To see beneath the surface of things to a reality in which evil does not exist. And in doing so, we can have it all. We can be totally innocent and we can be totally wise. We can see clearly. We can be free of anger. And from that place, we can go out and change the world. So, this is our middle way. This is our recognition that denial doesn't heal, but neither does anger. And as we say here so often, if we as core students do not stand for this alternative, then who will? Because Not very many people are saying it. And so right now, I have to be honest, those of us who are saying it 
are standing on very lonely ground. Because when people take issue with the Course's core tenets, that God's Son is guiltless and that unconditional forgiveness means unconditional forgiveness, there is a layer of anger and righteousness that gets applied. And there's not only a harsh rejection of that message, but there's often a harsh rejection of the messenger. And so when you're rejected on these kinds of things, there's a temptation to shut down and withdraw. Maybe even drop the course. And there's also a temptation to defend and attack. And as I was thinking about my own experience with both of these reactions, it occurred to me that they're really just variations of those first two stages. So when we withdraw, it's a negative form of denial. And when we get defensive, then it's just another form of that righteous anger. And so in the end, what's really going to create that change that we all want to see, if we're really going to create that healing in the world that we all want to see, it is not going to come from our denial or our anger, but it's going to come, as the Course says, from our love. Thank you.